Welcome to Stirring the Cauldron. Now, here's your host, Marla Brooks. Merry meet everybody and welcome back for a little more cauldron stirring tonight for those of you who have been here before. And for those of you who are new to the show, thanks for stopping by because I have a terrific show tonight. We've got author, lecturer, and journalist Nick Redfern here, and he's going to talk about unraveling the mystery of the human blood type to reveal the aliens among us from his new book, Bloodline of the Gods. It's a very thought-provoking book, which brings up the burning question, hmm, are your ancestors perhaps extraterrestrials? As always, if you have any questions for Nick, please send me a private message if you're in the Para-X chat room. And if not, why not come and join us at www.para-x.com. Hi, Nick, and welcome back. Hey, Marla. Thanks for having me on again. How's it going? Uh, it's going great. And every time you good. get a book that I get to read, I do the happy dance because I really love reading <laughs> your book. So oh, I'm, good I'm, to know. I'm really glad you're so prolific and I'm also really glad that you're willing to come back here and there so you know it, it, oh, it's, yeah. all it's, no problem at all. Yeah. it's all good well I, I learned a lot it was one of those things where I couldn't put the book down and, and there were things that opened my eyes and I'm like whoa okay this, this kind of makes sense to me and so when I say that you have when there's I mean evidence that at least 10% of us are descendants of an ancient and advanced alien civilization. I know there's a punchline waiting to happen, right? But let's jump to the RH negative factor that kind of calls into question the theory of evolution that we were all descended from the apes because clearly 10 to 15% of us weren't. And so for those who may not know what RH negative blood is, can we start by kind of explaining that and then we'll get a little bit deeper into it? Yeah, it's actually not that, you know, difficult to understand when you get the concepts of it, but there's there's basically four different uh, primary types of blood. That's A, B, A, B, and O. And as you said, roughly sort of 85 to about 90, 92% of us are known as what's called RH positive. And that basically means that our blood um, contains what are called antigens, and antigens are proteins found on the surface of blood cells that combat bacteria and viruses. And so, you know, they're, they're a critical part of our blood. But roughly, as I said, sort of 8, 10, 12 percent of the population um, are RH negative. That means they lack this particular antigen. And it's called RH because it's taken from the rhesus monkey, and it's known as a rhesus factor. So in other words, uh, we all have sort of this lineage um, which, you know, takes us back to the rhesus factor, as I said, but apart from this small percentage of people who don't. And, and you're right that this does have sort of an impact upon the theory of evolution from the perspective of, of well, you know, if we do all have this lineage, or most of us, why is it just most of us? Why isn't it all of us? Mm -hmm. And that kind of suggests that at some point um, something happened that caused this small percentage of the RH negatives to split away from the sort of the primary population. And to give you sort of an, an indication, um, current approximate estimates are, in, I'll give you the United States figures so you'll have a better understanding of that. Um, in the U.S., approximately 85% of all Caucasians uh, are RH positive, so at least like 15% negative. Um, the percentage of African Americans who are um, negative is roughly around 10%, and Asian Americans, it's around 2%. So, you know, the, the figures are low. Mm -hmm. But again, the big question is, why are the figures even existing in the first place? You know, mm -hmm. uh, that's the big issue. And... Um, but there's one group of people I talk about in the book, uh, the Basque people of Spain, that's B-A-S-Q-U-E. And mm -hmm. the Basque people, um, their figures are like between 45 and 60 percent. And um, so this suggests that, you know, for some reason they are extremely different to the rest of us. And, and the fact is that they are. Um, and it's not just their blood factor 
but they have a, a very unique language. Now, you know, I'm originally from England, and um, you can listen to, you know, some of the French words and the German words, and, you know, th there are some words which are similar. You know, they're not quite mm -hmm. the same, but they're similar for the same word in different languages. But the Basque people, it, there's nothing else like their language in Europe. It's, like, totally 100% unique. Um, and on top of that, they, um, the area in which they live is the area that previously was home to Crow Magnon Man tens of thousands of years ago. And we also find that in other areas where Crow Magnon Man lived, they also have today higher levels than normal of Rh negatives. And this has given rise to the theory that in all probability, Crow Magnon Man was Rh negative as well. And, you know, in the, as I said, the areas where he proliferated, um, the Rh negative gene survived and thrived, if you like. And then from there, that takes us back to the theory that it was Crow Magnon Man that was the one that was specifically genetically altered. So that's sort of like the taking us from right today in the 21st century right back through history and to you know tens of thousands of years ago when all of this may have kicked off. Yeah, and I think I read in the book too that the Basque also um, physically are similar to the Cro-Magnon man um, in yeah, structure. You're yeah. right. Yeah, they've got um, sort of broader, more fuller foreheads. Their noses are sort of more pronounced and their jaws are and they're built bulkier than, than the rest of us. Um, and when you look at them and you look at the Crow Magnons, yes, I mean, you know, th there's not a direct connection, but you can see clearly that they, the Basque people do stand out from the rest of the people in Europe. There's no doubt about that. So, you know, this seems to be a line that's continued and hasn't really changed that much. Um, and as I said, it's um, that's the one uh, place more than any other on the planet, um, certain portions of Spain and parts of France, where the Rh negatives dominate. And uh, as I said, tra tracing it back to the cro magnons then allows us to sort of look at when all of this might have originally started to go down. Mm -hmm. Now, there are statistics that... Um when we're talking about aliens and abductees, there are statistics that show that there are more RH negative people than positives that are abducted. Is this right? Yeah, I mean, th this is one of the interesting things is that not only do we get a lot of um, RH negatives who are abductees, but also a lot of people are just driven to look into the UFO subject and read about it. Even if they're not sure why, they just kind of feel you know, drawn to it in some way. And um, and I don't think that's coincidence. I mean, in terms of the abductees, one of the important things is this, is that if, you know, tens of thousands of years ago we were genetically altered, um, and if you look at today's abduction as a parallel, well, genetics is very often at the heart of a lot of the abduction stories. You know, mm -hmm. you hear of uh, people being taken on board UFOs and... DNA and uh, eggs and sperm being taken and um, abductees being shown like for example hybrid babies and hybrid children and things like that mm -hmm. which kind of suggests that even if you know tens of thousands of years ago this was done on more sort of a planet-wide scale today it seems to be you know scaled down but we could make a good argument that because there's a substantial number of RH negatives still involved that the program is still going on you know, it may well have been in the wide open world, you know, tens of thousands of years ago. But today it's been done in more sort of a stealthy, secret way. But, you know, you can make a good argument that the, the fact that it is the RH negative still, that it's it's the exact same program progressing from then till now. Mm -hmm. And you just mentioned that many people that are involved in alien research are RH negative. And and so, since you do lots of extraterrestrial research, the question that begs to be asked is, what blood type are you? You know, um, I actually don't know what blood type I am. <laughs> um, I've, uh, knock on wood, I've never actually been in hospital or had any diseases or illnesses or conditions ever. Um, the worst I kind of get is like a cold a year, so I've never, I've never had to have blood drawn for a 
you know, um, medical issues or whatever. Um, but, you know, um, it was, I, I, I really ought to find out because it would be, yes. a, it'd be a good talking point if it turns out I am actually RH negative. But, I mean, on the, on the issue of authors and writers um, in the UFO field, I actually have an entire chapter on this in the book, and it deals with a controversial issue called inherited memory. Now, you know, all of us, or most of us at least, um, we inherit some traits from our parents, you know, whether it's hair colour, eye colour, you know, shape of your face or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a controversial theory, as I said, the inherited memory theory, that literally within our deep, uh, buried in our subconscious, we can actually, if we know how to do it, we could access literally inherited memories or fragments of memories. And so the theory is that people may be drawn to this particular subject, and particularly the RH negatives, because deeply buried and encoded within their subconscious are memories of, you know, this entire lineage, lineage of the RH negatives and the UFO associations. So they're drawn to it. They know there's a reason why, but they can't put the finger fully on it. Now, what's interesting is that much of the book deals with the whole ancient astronauts situation, obviously, you know, going back thousands of thousands of years. And it turns out that the most famous, world famous um, of all um, ancient astronaut authors, Eric Von Daniken, is RH negative. Yes. And also um, another famous author who's written extensively on the mysteries of the past, Brad Steiger, he's also um, RH negative and uh, the late Robert Anton Wilson, um, he was someone who was deeply interested in ancient pyramid mysteries. He was RH negative. So, you know, you have three of the leading figures who've written about these subjects and they've all got, you know, the RH negative bloodline running through them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and <laughs> it will be interesting at some point if you find out whether you are or not. And, and I <laughs> yeah, think I, the reason... <laughs> I'll probably I'll get it done. I'll let you know uh, what I am or what I'm not. <laughs> well, yeah, just just for you know, giggles. Yeah. Um, it would be nice to know. But I, it's just it's really kind of interesting that all of this kind of comes together in a very strange way. Um, now, how you also write about the fact that RH negative people might be a little bit unlike the rest of us. Um, I'm not suggesting that they're not entirely human, but they are a little bit quirky and different, correct? Well, there's actually some interesting physical differences. Now, um, a small percentage of the population every year, a lot of people don't know this, but a small percentage are born with an extra vertebra in the back. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, unless you've got to go in hospital for uh, back surgery, you would never know. You know, it's not like it causes any issues for the most part. Um, but the percentage in RH negatives who have an extra vertebra is actually proportionately higher than the rest of us who aren't RH negative. Now, this actually ties in with the famous or the most famous of all abduction stories, the um, Betty and Barney Hill case of uh, 1961. Now, mm -hmm. the Hills were from New Hampshire, and when they were driving home after a vacation, they had this uh, abduction experience in September 61, and couldn't really remember afterwards everything that had happened. They knew that something strange had happened, that they'd seen something, and there were clearly aspects of the story that were jumbled in their minds as if, you know, it was almost as if they were rendered into a sort of a dreamlike state. And over sort of the next couple of days, weeks and months, they started to get bad dreams and nightmares about being taken on board this craft and subjected to all sorts of weird experimentation. And um, what happened from there is they decided to get regressive hypnosis. And um, a lot of information came out. But what was sort of really interesting and relevant to this story of the extra vertebra is that Barney Hill said that when he was sort of you know, laid out on this table and the aliens were sort of watching him and experimenting, and et cetera, they um, kept running their fingers down his spine and he actually said he felt, with hindsight, that they were counting his vertebra. Now, bear in mind, he made this statement in the early 60s, um, you know, long before, really, the whole alien abduction phenomenon was even talked about. You know, this was really the kicking off of it all. 
Um, mm -hmm. And certainly nobody was talking about the RH negative issue, never mind in conjunction with UFOs. And it, but here's um, Barney Hill talking about aliens counting his vertebra, which makes you wonder if they were trying to figure out without extracting blood if he was RH negative. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, you is. know, we've got that. And, and we've also got issues like um, RH negatives typically have slightly low, slightly lower blood pressure. Um, you know, if it's normal, it's around about 120 over 80. If you've got um, like 115 over um, 75, you know, that's perfect. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, they're good in that sense. And also pulse is still uh, slightly lower as well. And that's a good thing to have a slightly lower than normal pulse. Now, I actually, I have, you know, I haven't had my blood checked, but my average pulse since I've been a kid has been like 60, you know. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. um, I mean, there was one time when I was, you know, uh, I mean, I'm still, I still keep fit, but there was one time when, um, you know, the fitter you get, your pulse rate actually drops. Then I do, did mm. a lot of, uh, I used to play soccer and rugby and swim for the school and, uh, you know, a big soccer fan anyway. So, I've, you know, I've always been active. At one point when I was really active, my average pulse went down to like about 54. And wow. uh, I was like, geez, you know, don't, don't get any slower. But I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just to give you an example, though, that one of the sort of most fittest people, certainly in the 70s, um, a lot of people today might not know the name, but the well-known famous uh, tennis player Bjorn Borg, Mm -hmm. um, his pulse rate was average was 32. Oh, wow. You know, which is like barely a beat every two seconds. You know, you'd be uh -huh. kind of thinking, is he going to, is he going to kick in again? You know? <laughs> <laughs> no. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, they have slightly, but that was a bit of a diversion, but I mean, yeah, they have slightly <laughs> lower, um, pulse rate, um, uh, slightly lower, uh, blood pressure. But one down, well, there's actually two downsides we can talk about. One is, um, that very often RH negatives don't do well in high temperatures and direct sunlight. Um, they get sort of tired much quicker. They burn more easily. Um, so that's, you know, something to look out for when we're looking at patterns. But the most sort of critical and dangerous angle relates to pregnancy. Now, let's say, for example, you've got a man who's RH positive and a woman who's RH negative. The woman gets pregnant, and now normally you know, there's no particular issue um, because, you know, again, something a lot of people may not know is that, you know, although, you know, the, the growing fetus, you know, is essentially nourished by the mother, mm -hmm. the baby's bloodstream and the mother's bloodstream actually don't cross. That it's one of these sort of unique things where, yes, you know, the nourishment reaches the baby, but the bloodstreams don't mingle. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, you know, if there's an issue where the fetus needs to be examined, you know, they'll do this procedure where they'll insert a little needle and take a few cells or possibly blood cells from the fetus to examine. And it's a routine procedure normally. But if you have a woman who's RH positive, pregnant woman, and the baby is RH negative, if, you know, the, the nurse or the doctor that's performing it makes a little slip up and some of the blood gets into the mother's bloodstream, some of the baby's Rh negative blood gets into her positive bloodstream, almost immediately her immune system launches an attack on the fetus. I mean, literally an attack. It literally tries to kill the unborn fetus. Um, mm -hmm. And it's extremely, it can be an extremely critical situation. At the very least, it can cause acute anemia. Um, and fortunately today, um, we have drugs that can combat this and that, they combat it very well so it's not very often that it, it becomes an issue but doctors do warn women that if it's happened once that they should really think twice about um, not having a second child and certainly not a third the reason being that the um, the mother's um, immune system and antibodies develop to a greater degree with every pregnancy, so it becomes more and more difficult to prevent damage occurring to the baby with subsequent births. So, no point intended, the mother's immune system and um, essentially sees the baby as alien in the sense it's not like her. So that, that in itself is weird. It is, and I, I know this because I've worked, I worked for an OBGYN for mm. a number of years, and we had that come up here and there. 
And it was always scary when somebody would come in who never had any prenatal care and they would show up at, you know, the seventh or eighth month and decide that they need care. And then you do the blood and it's like, holy, holy, you know, yeah. now we got to do something really quick. So, yeah, that is that is kind of um, precarious. Um, all right. So, I mean, there's one. Uh, well, there's just one other quick thing. I'll just no, tell you to take a second. Um, yeah. You know, the um, until we understood, you know, what blood was, and we and the fact that there are different groups. Um, you know, this is actually only really determined or started to be determined in the early part of the 20th century. If you right. go back to like the uh, American Civil War. You know, a lot of soldiers died on the battlefield, not necessarily always from like bullet wounds or cannons or whatever. It was because we didn't understand the different blood groups. And, you know, when transfusions would occur, sometimes they would work well, sometimes you'd get the wrong blood and the person would die from shock, you know, for having the wrong blood transfused into them. But what's interesting is that type O negative, it's called the um, universal donor. And mm -hmm. it's called the universal donor because anyone can receive type O blood and be perfectly fine. But what's equally weird is that type O negative people can only receive type O negative blood. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like something has been designed where it's almost like it sounds like, you know, the ultimate perfect blood in the sense that anyone can receive it, but it has means to prevent itself from being um, altered. You know, it remains sort of the elite because, you know, it can't be tainted with any other kind of blood, so to speak. So that in itself yeah. is strange too. It is. It is. All right. So simply put, at some point in time, way, way back, aliens genetically mm -hmm. altered some members of the human race. I mean, this is our assumption. Um, so what? for what purpose do you think? Were they well, yeah, this to... sort of gets... Yeah, this gets to the crux of the story. The idea that um, the so the most prevalent theory is that this was the um, the work of the so-called Anunnaki, and you know, depending on how you view the Anunnaki, they were either some sort of godlike creatures, deities, or you know, from today's perspective, they were visiting extraterrestrials. And certainly, the one person more than any other who championed all this was the um, late Zachariah Sitchin. And he came to the conclusion from looking at the ancient texts and interpreting the, the historical data that we have that they came here to create a, essentially a slave race and that the planet was going to be used as it, for its resources. Um, you know, in other words, um, we would be the workers and the earth would be turned into, for all intents and purposes, a factory. And um, the the idea being that you know, to find um, adequate beings that could do the work for them. Now, what's interesting is that if we look at, for example, Cro-Magnon Man and Neanderthal Man, which were sort of competing at the same time, um, you know, they developed very quickly, almost out of nowhere. And before that, you know, we have evidence of, you know, small humanoid ape semi-human creatures in Africa. You know, we have bones going back millions of years, little sort of three foot tall, ape-like creatures, but then we have this leap, you know, with like Neanderthal man and Cro-Magnon man, and that's, you know, that's one of the anomalies as well. Um, what caused this leap? Well, if you want to refine uh, an earlier species and upgrade it and genetically alter it, that might um, explain why there's more of a spontaneous than a gradual development. And if you look at Cro-Magnon man, um, you know, he, the, he wasn't sort of like the stereotypical image that people have of, in, in simple terms, cavemen. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's probably looking back to school days and things like that. People think of cavemen. They think of a guy in like a bear skin with a club in one hand and dragging his wife back to the cave by the hair in the other, you know. Um, mm -hmm. That's the sort of the image we have of cavemen, or a lot of people do. But if you look at Crow Magnum Man, uh, and actually, interestingly enough, um, Neanderthal man too, their brain capacity or their brain size was actually bigger than ours. Their brains were bigger by roughly the size of a baseball or just slightly smaller. Um, their craniums, you know, their, their skull capacity was bigger. Um, we know from, their, from finding the remains that they had a fully understanding of the nature of death and, you know, what it implied from the perspective, you know, that they they buried their dead and sort of revered the dead and celebrated them. Um, 
And if you look at some of the cave, well, all the cave paintings in France done by the Crow Magnons, I mean, they would easily kind of rival anything you'd see in a museum or an art, or an art gallery today. You know, mm -hmm. they're just sort of perfect artwork of animals running across the, you know, the fields and the forests and the plains. And so, in other words, they were highly evolved and they also seem to have a fascination for the stars and the constellations and the planets. So it totally throws out the window this, this image, like I said, of, you know, sort of primitive uh, cavemen. Um, mm -hmm. So that is the, the most sort of widespread accepted theory, the one that we're dealing with um, the creation of a slave race for a, a race of entities that wanted to use us to essentially you know, turn the planet into uh, a resource uh, for, for them. But, okay, so, but this has been going on for like millennia. And, and so how come they have not been able to develop that race successfully from way back then to now, in your opinion? Well, well, I, th I think if you look at the, the, the big picture, it's kind of a little bit different to that. Um, I mean, the story of the Anunnaki you know, goes back tens of thousands of years, but mm -hmm. the story also suggests that the vast majority of them, when they were done with the planet, they left. But, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't like they stayed around. However, what we see in later years is possibly the tables turned now, because the abduction seems to be tied in with the RH negative issue, we could make a good argument that it's still the Anunnaki to some degree that are involved. But mm -hmm. in the way that they may have used us in the distant past, as I said, like a slave race, it's possible mm -hmm. today that the tables have turned in the sense that the so-called greys of alien abduction law, um, they, when you see them and you hear these stories about abductions, it almost sounds like their reliance on, you know, using us as, as something to upgrade them and, you know, prevent them from downgrading. You know, a lot of stories about the greys looking sickly and, you know, stories about them not, you know, having a, a good evolutionary gene pool anymore. So it's mm -hmm. possible that, I, you know, one of the biggest ironies after so many tens of thousands of years of being our superiors and using us, now basically they've got a you know, albeit secretly, rely on us for their survival. And so that might explain why there was sort of this huge presence tens of thousands of years ago, reportedly all across the planet, with all these massive mining operations and resources going on. But then they left. Then they may have been forced to come back when something critical happened. And then they're forced, as I said, to embark on a new genetic program but of a very different nature, one designed to ensure their survival. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have a chapter in the book called Reptiles from the Stars. Now, I could be wrong, but I've always heard that the gray aliens are absolutely the vilest of creatures. But in the reptile chapter, there is mention that the grays are not much more than worker bees for the reptiles. And that the reptiles are kind of <clears throat> shape-shifting monsters that have lived among us forever. And because they can take on human form, they've infiltrated society, military, the government. Um, and, and they're really the secret rulers of the world. And all of that is a rather daunting thought, isn't it? Well, it is. I mean, you know, this is one of the most controversial parts of the book, you know, and I, and I point out to people that it, that it is controversial. Um, I mean, a lot of people have spoken about, you know, being on alien craft or in underground installations where they've seen the greys and they, what you can only describe as like seven to eight foot tall upright lizards. That's the best way you could describe them. Mm -hmm. And the... Many of the people who have reported these experiences have said that they felt that the reptilians were overseeing the procedures, that the the greys were almost like almost like worker ants in an ant colony, you know, they were doing all the work. And then you have like mm -hmm. the queen ant who's sort of, you know, ruling it. It was something along those lines that the reptilians were either in charge or they were like a second level where they were overseeing the workers. Now mm -hmm. As far as the, I mean, there actually is a tie-in, um, you know, with this whole issue of even the Anunnaki. Because uh, some people, some researchers believe that the Anunnaki may actually have been reptilian in nature. 
Others take the view that, you know, as we said, this issue of shape-shifting or possibly the ability to affect the human mind into thinking they're seeing something reptilian. In other words, the idea of mind control, mind manipulation to create an image, you know, a frightening image that may actually be more of like a like a holographic image projected and, you know, you would unknowingly not realize that it's that's not its true form. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of, you know, stories like this. And um, I point out that, I mean, although I have to say, I don't believe and you know, or agree with these stories that, you know, the the British royal family are a bunch of <laughs> lizards, you know. <laughs> I mean, God knows I don't like the royal family, you know. I don't agree with the concept <laughs> of a royal family. Um, but... I have to say, I don't think, you know, the Queen is like some, you know, she goes to bed and strips off her skin and there's this, you know, lizard where she's eating live rats or whatever, that kind of thing. Does know? that not remind you of one of the Doctor Who episodes a couple of years ago? <laughs> they, they did exactly <laughs> I don't think I saw that. that one, but, oh, oh okay. you must, but, you must. But, but what is interesting, and I do think this is quite plausible, is that, you know, this whole RH negative blood was perceived... By, by the ancients, you know, they revered blood. It was something connected with the gods. It was something important, you know. Today, it's important to us because it helps keep us alive. But back then, there was something special about it. So clearly, down the generations, knowledge had been passed that, you know, the nature of blood, and if you had the elite blood, you were sort of one with the gods, so to speak, that kind of thing. And on top of that, what, I think, and granted it's a theory, but I think it's a plausible theory, if the Anunnaki left and, you know, they at one point intended not to come back, well, they might still want to try and find a way to rule the planet. Now, what better way than to have, like, a secret elite of RH negatives? Now, they, the Anunnaki wouldn't be ruling the planet directly, but they would be ruling it by what we could call, like, by proxy. You know, that they would be gone, but they would have left something behind. So I do find it fascinating, you know, that a number of U.S. presidents were RH negative, that the British royal family is littered with them. Um, mm -hmm. There's also, you know, some uh, very infamous RH negatives who changed the course of history. Probably the most famous one was Lee Harvey Oswald. And it just so happens that his wife, Marina, she's also, uh, who's still alive, she's also uh, RH negative. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, you have a lot of influential people um, in elite areas and, you know, historical areas that carry the RH negative genes. So I do wonder if, you know, these stories about the royal family being lizards actually is a sort of a wild distortion of the fact that they're RH negative and we can trace the RH negative gene back to extraterrestrials. Mm -hmm. I know. It's, you know, really kind of... Well, you're going to have to watch Doc, the uh, Doctor Who episode. I will send you a link to that. But um, beyond well, I that, remember, I mean... I do mm. remember when I was a kid um, watching that show V. Um, that was, I don't know if you... Well, it was an American show, so it was obviously... Yeah, somebody in the chat room was... Yeah, they're talking about that in the chat room. Yeah, well, that was on English TV when I was a kid, and uh, I was about, I don't know, I think about 17 when it... Bruce broadcast. It was really popular in England. Everybody watched it, and um, but that's that's sort of pretty close to the image that a lot of people have. But in saying that, I mean, I've spoke to a number of abductees, really credible, who swore. You know, they said we were in these locations and we saw these things, and they were, you know, they were flesh and blood, upright lizards. You know, very menacing looking. So, I mean, who knows what's going on? I mean, that's that's one of the things we're forced to sometimes do in subjects like this is to speculate and theorize. But when I do that, I always obviously tell people that's what I'm doing. And I always try and find corroborating information that adds to the theory, you know, because if it's just a theory with no backing, well, you know, you, you, you basically sort of lost at sea without a, without a battle. But if, for example, you know, we can t talk about things like, you know, Barney Hill's um, extra vertebra, Things like this add to the theory and, and give it more weight. So I think that's, you know, an important thing we have to do, even though we don't have all the answers. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, it was, I mean, maybe, you know, people are going to cringe at this, but in one of the chapters you're talking about the abductees that actually um, 
were mating with the lizards and and oh, yeah. with the reptiles. Yeah. And and yeah. the thing of it is, I mean, the the weird thing is that some, you know, one woman was just, it was great. She was ecstatic about it. Another oh, one yeah, was like, yeah. oh, my so, God, yeah. it, it killed me. <laughs> it was so painful and, and everything. And but the, but the thing that made me laugh out loud at that, because as I was reading this, at first I'm thinking, oh, well, they're still trying to develop some hybrids. But, well, there, but, but you wrote something in there that said that <laughs> perhaps they were just, the lizards, were, the reptiles were just doing it because it was fun. You know, I mean. Well, I mean, who knows? I mean, you know, this gets into some really bizarre areas. But, yeah, a, a number of women have said, you know, they... They looked intimidating, but they really enjoyed it. Now, I mean, from my perspective, I mean, I, I don't mind a wild woman, but I, I draw the line at one who's going to sort of shape shift into a, a lizard. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that would just <laughs> um, be a little. But um, you know, I, I like I like my women to be human rather than you know something from the Jurassic Age. <laughs> and, um, yeah. But uh, but yeah, I mean, joking aside, a lot of I must say a lot. I mean, a number of women have said that. It wasn't, you know, an unpleasant experience. Um, and but one or two have actually said that they were terrified, and then after, although they enjoyed it, they felt that they were sort of being mind manipulated to kind of calm them down. In other words, if they were in a normal state, they would have been in like a state of shock and fear. Yeah. But yeah. you know, something could alter their mindset um, to prevent the normal natural reaction from occurring. You know. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, the assumption is that, that hybrids, and whether it uh, has anything to do with this that we were just talking about or not, do exist. Um, and um, two of the categories, I mean, we're, I mean, we're talking about the hybrids, but there's also the black-eyed children. And yeah. they're, they're scary. I mean, when you read about it, I mean, they've been called an urban legend, and but there have been supposedly reported sightings. Um, and tales of both hybrids and the black-eyed children scare the bejesus out of people. What's your opinion on both of those? Well, yeah, I mean, this, the most interesting thing about it first is that if, you know, if we go back to Betty and Barney Hill, that was sort of, at least, not the first abduction, but certainly the widely reported first abduction. And yeah. we had other abductions then in the 70s of a similar nature with, you know, with aspects of like a genetic component, a reproductive component. Mm -hmm. Then in the 80s, we started to hear more about the missing time angle from people like Bud Hopkins. And then in the early 90s, that's when it really kicked off with the so-called hybrid children, where um, people would report seeing onboard UFOs or, again, the underground installations. Mm -hmm. um, children and babies that look semi like us and semi alien in the sense that they were skinny, thin, their eyes weren't necessarily black, but the eyes were oversized and they had wispy, thin hair. And of course, you know, the greys are known for not having any hair. So they're almost like a halfway between us and them. Mm -hmm. And there are also stories about the sort of hybrid babies being grown in, uh, you know, numerous rows of endless tanks, you know, that kind of thing, glass tanks, mm -hmm. that sort of scenario. Um, mm -hmm. And this has led to um, a development, if you like, which you can view as positive or sinister. The, one, the positive angle is the idea that perhaps they're trying to create hybrids so one day we can all be integrated together and we won't view them as hostile because they'll look more human. Uh, you know, we, mm -hmm. won't, they won't be, we won't be so intimidated by them. Um, right. The other angle, which is a far more sinister one, is that they're literally trying to infiltrate us for sinister reasons. Um, I've actually got a lot of stories which, I mean, this could be a book all of its own, of people seeing sort of very weird-looking people um, where they actually felt they were sort of extraterrestrials in disguise, wearing, like, for example, um, long trench coats, uh, fedora hats, sunglasses, and this kind of adds to the like the many black mystery, you know, that's how they appear. But also very strange skin, um, where the witnesses have said they've looked at the person, it was impossible to tell their age, you know, were they uh, sort of you know, an oldish thirty or a youngish fifty five or whatever, you know, that and it was it was kind of strange. They had sort of adult faces but baby like skin. 
you know, which mm-hmm. would look really creepy, you know, yeah. if somebody kind of overdone it on the Botox or whatever, you know. <laughs> um, and that's how a lot of them look. And one of the theories is they walk amongst us not to find out what we're doing or to frighten us. They want to know what it, to what extent they're going to be noticed or not. And if nobody notices them, they know they're doing a good job. Um, mm-hmm. And then in the last sort of six or seven years, we've had the rise of these stories of the black-eyed children. Now, the black-eyed children actually sound like childlike versions of the, the men in black. You know, the, they have the black eyes, and sometimes, although the men in black don't have black eyes, you know, they will very often wear black sunglasses. So who's to say what's going on behind those sunglasses? Um, and so... But with the black-eyed children, they very often wear black hoodies as well. So you've got the hat component. The men in black wear the black fedoras. Black-eyed children wear the black uh, hoodies. Um, mm-hmm. The skin texture and colours the same, sort of very pale and white and, and smooth. Um, and also like the men in black, the black-eyed children try and find ways and excuses to get into people's homes, um, and which is quite sinister, you know, that both categories try and do that. And um, so this is sort of like the very latest aspect of this entire issue. Now, you know, when you said about it being sort of modern day urban legend, a good friend of mine, David Weatherly, wrote a a really good book on this called The Black Eyed Children a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And David got literally dozens of stories, people speaking on the record um, about their own encounters. And... There's actually a a huge body of reports now of the black-eyed children showing not only is it sort of not just uh, an urban legend, but it actually dates back much further than people realise. And a lot of people just didn't report these reports, or these sightings, I should say, because they didn't really know what to think about it, or it was just something odd and random that had occurred in their lives. And it's only now last few years, thanks to people like David, that we're starting to see this huge pattern developing. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's strange. And, you know, when we're talking about the, the hybrids and stuff, um, in the book you're talking also about the fact that abductees have been encouraged to bond with the hybrid babies and the children. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for a minute I thought, well, that's odd. But then all of a sudden it came to mind that perhaps if that is actually happening... Maybe they're doing it to humanize these hybrids. Does that make sense? Well, there's a couple of theories. One is to sort of humanize them, to make them more like us. But the other theory is that the original greys just don't know how to relate, you know, that they've been refined or altered themselves, possibly to the point where they just are sort of worker entities, you know, without any sort of... Um, own degree of individuality, you know, or own personalities. They're just they're just there to perform a task, and so they don't have that emotional bond, um, you know, that that the mother would have with a with a baby. So that might be one possibility. I mean, I'll give you a reason why that could be the answer. Um, you know, if you look at our technology, in many ways, it can you know, expand and develop in a very positive way. But then there are also ways that might turn out in the long run not to be positive. And a lot of research is being done now into the feasibility one day of creating artificial wombs so a a woman would never have to give birth to a baby. You know, the baby would grow in an artificial Mm -hmm. womb in a factory somewhere. And, you know, theories of doctors and scientists who've looked into these angles have said, well, you know, if we go down that path, it's entirely possible that the the natural bond that, you know, between a mother and, and the baby that occurs, you know, through pregnancy and birth, that could be lost. And we could end up going the same way as the greys, where it becomes more of, you know, you go into the, you know, the lab and you decide what colour you want your uh, baby's hair to be and the eye colour and etc you know your eggs are taken the sperm's taken and it's like well, thanks very much Mrs Smith come back in nine months that kind of thing <laughs> yeah. you know we could find joking aside we could find ourselves going down a path where we lose that bond and maybe that happens to the greys maybe they they just cannot fathom and understand how they need to relate and so they they use people who can relate to you know a, a child or a baby which is us the humans yeah and that makes that makes perfect sense 
Now, some of the hybrid children, I mean, do you, do you think they are down here living among us? And, and how did they get here? I mean, did abductees give birth to them and, you know, without knowing or any other theories on that? Well, one of the theories is the idea of in the initial abductions that, you know, eggs and sperm is ta are taken and they're then used to create, you know, it's spliced with alien DNA and then, you know, created in these tanks and labs, etc. So in other words, you know, after the abduction, um, that the, the abductee plays no further role in it other than when perhaps they're re-abducted and they're presented with the baby after it's born or grown, and, and then they're encouraged to, you know, interact with it. But there are actually some quite sinister stories, which I didn't touch upon in the book, you know, sort of limited by the word count which the publisher allows, but mm -hmm. um, there are some very sinister and disturbing stories about women claiming to have been abducted and becoming pregnant, and then losing the baby under very weird circumstances. You know, I'm sure it must be you know, beyond traumatic for when somebody, you know, happens to someone, a miscarriage. But mm -hmm. in some of these cases, it, it's almost as if the person was in a fog or a haze and sometimes they, then they don't have a clear memory of it. And under hypnosis, and bear in mind, of course, you know, we always have to remember that with, in hypnosis, we're never really sure, you know, what's going on fully. But there are a number of stories of women under hypnosis talking about, the unborn fetus being removed before it came to term and then, you know, uh, placed into these tanks as if they allowed it to sort of reach an age of three or four months and then removed it and um, whatever technologies they got, you know, allowed the continuation of the growth in their environment. But of mm -hmm. course, you know, that's an extremely controversial angle and it's definitely not one that's, you know... Um, is, the, is mentioning the majority of the cases, but there are, you know, a few dozen stories like that. Yeah, I mean, I, it could be any number of things, and, and one could be just as horrible as the other, you know, I mean, you just don't know. Now, I, I think that many people believe that not just hybrids, but aliens in general are living amongst us and, and have been for centuries. And... Um, I guess maybe you touched on this a little bit, bit earlier, but why do you think they're here? And and I'm sure there's way more than one answer to that. Um, well, yeah, I, I definitely think, you know, if we look at what's going on in today's abductions, I think in the same way that possibly they saw the planet as a resource um, tens of thousands of years ago, today we're the resource. You know, they're reliant on us to possibly even ensure their survival. You know, we, we're still a commodity, but it's it's not the planet that's the commodity. It's our DNA. You know, it's our genes and everything else that goes along with it. Um, but there could be other reasons as well. I mean, um, you know, perhaps the... I mean, what's interesting, there have been a lot of reports over the years of um, UFOs seen in the vicinity of mines. I talk about, for example, how in the 50s the CIA was taking note of... Um, UFO sightings over uranium mines in the Congo and gold mm. mines as well. Gold actually comes into play with the Anunnaki and this whole uh, mining operation. So, mm -hmm. you know, maybe there's still a resource angle going on. Um, and then you get some more weirder stories, and which are also quite disturbing. The idea that um, a number of abductees have said that they felt that the aliens or whatever they are, you know, we don't really know what they are. They could be like multidimensional. They could be anything. You know, it's just yeah. a fear that they are literally extraterrestrial. But mm -hmm. one of the things that a lot of abductees have said is that the so-called greys seem to have an interest in the human soul. And um, they got a feeling that they were trying to understand the nature of the soul. Some people felt that they were actually able to sort of extract from the human body like a, a life force or, or extract the soul and manipulate oh. it. And, and what's interesting is that Whitley Strieber uh, in his communion book, which is, for me, is one of the best alien abduction stories because he actually covers a lot of alternative theories. He was told by these entities that, you know, he said, well, what, what are you doing? Why are you here? Why are you doing this? And he said that one of the entities told him, uh, they, they actually said, we recycle souls as if, you know, the human no. race is almost like a factory, you know, we're like a farm, and they, they recycle us constantly over and over. 
Um, oh. but there's a lot of weird stories, you know, as I said, linking manipulation of the human soul. And Strieber came to believe that even if these things are extraterrestrial, that possibly they have the ability to sort of exist in the realm of the afterlife as well, which sort of gives it an entirely different component. You know, maybe that's one of the reasons why government agencies don't tell us what's going on, because, you know, it's not just possibly nuts and bolts aliens. It could be entities that somehow straddle our world and, you know, imagine straddling this world and straddling the world of the dead, you know, <laughs> what comes in after life, that they have a full understanding of it and they can manoeuvre within and out of it. Um, you know, if we are some sort of big soul recycling farm, you know, that would be pretty alarming, I think, if it was proved to be true, of course. Wow, that's really something that's going to take thinking about it to get my head wrapped yeah. around any part of that. I mean, it's rather amazing. Um, the hour is flying by way too fast, and I think we have just enough time to have you tell everybody um, what you might be up to lately, any other books in the making, where people can find you and your books and upcoming events, all that good stuff? Yeah, sure. Well, um, I've actually got another book out right now with another company um, called Llewellyn. It's called Chupacabra Road Trip. And um, as the title suggests, it's sort of written in a diary on the road style of all my expeditions looking for the Chupacabra over the last I 10 years <laughs> all across Puerto Rico, uh, Mexico, the U.S. So, and it's written in sort of a you know, road trip spirit where the morning spent interviewing a Chupacabra witness, then in the afternoon I'm racing around the rainforest investigating you know, um, sites where the Chupacabra is seen, and then the evenings chilling out with a margarita in the bar in San Juan or whatever, that kind of thing. Mm. And um, then I've got um, actually another book on the Men in Black, which would be my third book coming out in about a month. Mm. And as far as um, speaking things I've got going on, um, I'll be speaking at the Paradigm Symposium in Minneapolis first weekend in October. Then the second weekend I'll be speaking at the Texas Bigfoot Conference. And the third conference... In the, in the third weekend, I'll be speaking at the New Mexico MUFON conference. Cool. Um, got a website or a Facebook page yeah. or, yeah. Yeah, well, people can, uh, if they type in Nick Redfern at Facebook, uh, they'll find me. There's, there's seven or eight Nick Redfern. If you scroll down, you'll see me in a black hoodie. Um, not, look, <laughs> not unlike one of the black and white children. <laughs> no, I was just thinking that. <laughs> and uh, so you'll find me there, or you can find me on Twitter, and if people want to find my blog, which I update, update most days, uh, days it's uh, titled uh, World of Whatever. So if you type in Nick Redfern, World of Whatever, that'll take you to my uh, blog link. Perfect, perfect. Well, I, I just, it's always a pleasure having you come to visit and um, do come back. I will. Because there's just so much good to talk about. And, um, yeah, well, just, you know, let me know when you ever want me on. I'll be, uh, you know, I'll be happy to come back on. Oh, you know, every other week would be fine, Nick. That would work, and 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 you almost have that many books, so we could be, we could do it really yeah, well. Yeah, I could well have a new one uh, written by next week, so it might work out. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you could. Yes, you could. Yeah. All right, I will definitely be in touch. And um, the Chupacabra road trip just kind of tickling my fancy a little bit, so we'll we'll see. Oh, I might well, have to. Uh, I'll make sure they send you a copy. Okay, I'll great. Send you a copy. I mean, Tim and I might have to arm wrestle for this one, and we might end up having to do a two-hour Reb and Witch show, combined show with this. But we'll we'll work out the details later. So right, cool. anyway, <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. And I want to thank everybody else for listening in tonight as well. And until next time, everybody, blessed be and merry meet again. Good night. This has been another edition of Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks. Be sure to tune in next week at the same time for another great guest and more cauldron stirring. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2014. Moonlight Hall by Kevin McLeod. Licensed through Incompetech.com.